Back in April, when Tiao Collective first formed, we were very new and very <laughs> um, trying to find and figure out the landscape. And Vijay was actually one of the first people we reached out to to email. And we really credit Vijay for supporting us, encouraging us, and also providing very good notes of feedback. Great. So. Um, Vijay Prashad is the director of Tri-Continental, and he will be giving a half-hour closing keynote with potential Q&A afterwards, depending on how he feels. <laughs> okay, great. Let's give it up for Vijay. Hello. Uh, it's great to be here. Uh, thanks to the Chow Collective. They do super work, correct? Yes. Excellent work. Chow Collective. Um, also, uh, thanks to Monthly Review. Tremendous, tremendous issues trying to cover the complexity of the debate in China. Incredible work. Monthly Review, one of the oldest voices of socialism, unbroken legacy from 1949. Incredible institution. I hope you read Monthly Review. Thanks very much, of course, to Code Pink. Jody is here from Code Pink, and if you want, you can get one of these flyers. Cutthepentagon.org. Pretty good idea, I think. <laughs> cut the Pentagon. It's time we cut the Pentagon, is the slogan. <laughs> and the legendary Jody Evans, you know, when they created Code Pink, it was because the United States, after 9-11, 20 years ago, decided that the answer you know, to an attack on the United States is to go and destroy the world. Um, when the dragon has its skin poked, it decides to breathe fire on everything. And Code Pink was set up essentially as a warning against doing exactly that. And of course, the United States government did exactly that. There were what, a million, 11, 10, 15 million people around the world marching against the illegal war on Iraq didn't make a jot of difference. Didn't make a jot of difference. So much for democracy. You know, how many hours people in this room spent in prison cells? Some of us handcuffed to bicycle racks because we were demonstrating against the war on Iraq. By the way, when I said an illegal war, again, it's not my opinion. UN Secretary General Kofi Annan in 2004 said that to BBC. He said it's an illegal war. Why is it illegal? Because, friends, we have some laws in the world. Some laws. Even international laws. For instance, for God's sake. I mean, I'm not even talking about the Communist Manifesto, okay? I mean, I'm not. Okay, I'm talking about the United Nations Charter. I mean, the country that violates the UN Charter the most is the United States of America. It's not China. It's not Russia. It's not India. It's not Mexico. It's certainly not Cuba. It's certainly not Cuba. It's the United States of America. The United States of America is the biggest scoff law on the planet. The United States of America didn't even have the decency to sign the Treaty of Rome. Now, you wonder, what the hell is the Treaty of Rome? <laughs> and why did I say it so emphatically? And that's because there still hasn't been a viral TikTok video explaining the <laughs> Treaty of Rome. <laughs> I'm not going to make one. <laughs> make one. See, once again, putting it off on me. The Treaty of Rome, friends, is the reason we have a so-called International Criminal Court. It's a so-called International Criminal Court because the biggest international criminal is not a signatory to it. And the biggest international criminal is... 
the United States of Amnesia. Rafi Kataria, one of the great poets of our time, friends. One of the great poets. The United States of Amnesia. The United States of Amnesia, America, whatever you want to call it, the US, etc., didn't sign the Treaty of Rome, will not allow a file to be opened to investigate US war crimes in Afghanistan and in Iraq. Mike Pompeo, head of the CIA, Secretary of State under Donald Trump, future president of the United States of America. That's what you say. You know how it goes in this great United States of America. You have President Nixon, and then you say, it can't get worse than this. And then you get Ronald Reagan, and then you say, it can't get worse than this. Then you get George W. Bush, can't get worse than this, and then you get Barack Obama, and it's the worst thing possible. <laughs> okay, I meant Donald Trump. Okay, I know. Some of you has, have incipient democratic sensibilities. You don't want me to criticize Obama? Okay. We'll put that off for another day. That's okay. It's okay. It's fine. The United States of America cannot have a file opened at the International Criminal Court on its behavior in Afghanistan or Iraq, and Mike Pompeo had the indecency to sanction Special Prosecutor at the ICC, Fatih Ben Souda, and her family. They would not be allowed to get visas. To, she was not allowed to get a visa to enter the United States to brief the UN Security Council because she had the nerve to open a file on US criminal activity in Afghanistan and Iraq. We know there were war crimes committed, and you know why we know that. We know that thanks to the bravery of Chelsea Manning and the WikiLeaks organization led by Julian Assange. We know this. Because Chelsea Manning bravely downloaded enough evidence of serious war crimes conducted by the United States in Iraq and Afghanistan. We know that. We know that. There's enough evidence out there. But Mike Pompeo decided, no, the ICC doesn't have the jurisdiction. Actually, they don't mean doesn't have the jurisdiction. What they mean is they don't have the right because what they're saying is white supremacy does not have the right to be judged by anybody. After NATO bombed Libya, the lead lawyer at NATO, Peter Olson, was asked by the United Nations to release bombing information so that the United Nations could judge whether NATO exceeded the mandate of UN Security Council 1973. That's what allowed NATO to bomb Libya under Charter 7 of the UN Charter. Chapter 7 of the UN Charter. Peter Olson wrote back and said, no, NATO does not commit war crimes. Only savages commit war crimes. See, I know you're wondering, this is supposed to be about China. This is supposed to be about China. Why is he talking about the United States? Because, friends, frankly, the United States does not have the right to judge anybody. The United States does not have the right to judge anybody. And as a subsection of that statement, the US left does not have the right to judge anybody. Because what gives the US left the right to do anything only comes after the US left builds political power in the United States. First you build power here, then let's talk. Otherwise, you're just a college professor. 
Otherwise, you're just a college professor. Or you're somebody who has nothing better to do than go on the internet and harass political forces outside the United States. So that's the first point. Because secondly, it's not just that the, listen, it's not just that the United States doesn't have the right to judge anybody. Look what the United States is doing. I mean, just think about this. I talked about Code Pink. Code Pink said in 2001, don't go to war in Afghanistan. The only elected official that joined Code Pink was Barbara Lee of California. Every single other member of the United States Congress enthusiastically said, let's go ahead and bomb that shitty country. That's what they said. Every single elected official of the United States government said, let's go and destroy Afghanistan. 20 years later, the United States has been humiliated by the Afghans. Now, I'm no fan of the Taliban, okay? I'm a Marxist, I'm a communist, I believe in women's emancipation, I believe in gay rights, I believe in everything good, decent, and sensitive in the world, which basically is everything the Taliban does not believe in, okay? So I'm not cheerleading for the Taliban. I think those guys are crazy, and I don't think they should be in power in Afghanistan. But let me tell you one thing. You can't defeat them by bombing them from the sky. You just can't do that. And that was the humiliation. The United States went all, we're coming, cowboys, big bombers, big, you know, special forces, Charlie's in town, you know, etc. Got the big gun, I got the gear, and then the Taliban <laughs> hiding behind a rock, just bang. <laughs> and, you know, Uncle Sam is like, where's the airport? <laughs> I'm going home. <laughs> Thank you for your service, sir. It's a humiliation, guys. It's a humiliation. Let's face it. What does Joe Biden do? Overseen a humiliation, you know, airport not secured. There will never be another terrorist act. And then boom, there's a terrorist act. What the hell do you call the explosion at the airport in Kabul? There will never be. It's incoherent, you know, and the, and the US media is incoherent. Well, we've never had a terrorist attack. There's just a terrorist attack yesterday, man. What do you call that? That's an explosion at the Kabul airport. That's not an explosion. That's, right? Strange. They live in a strange world. They think we are strange. That's what I find funny. You know, I meet my journalist friends and they're like, man, you're like a lunatic, you know. <laughs> and I'm like, I'm a lunatic. You're the lunatic. I mean, you know, like there was an explosion at the, at the airport, right? You know, wh what's that? Like, oh, yeah, I forgot. Sorry. It's not a terrorist attack because guess what? Oh, Afghans died. I forgot. It's not a terrorist attack because Afghans died. If there had been more Americans killed, that would have been a terror. I forgot. Sorry. You're right. There hasn't been a terrorist attack since 9-11. Because since 9-11, Al-Qaeda and the Islamic State, they've mainly been killing Syrians, Kenyans, people in Uganda. You know, sorry, I forgot. That's not a terrorist attack. That's just savages killing savages. Whole other different thing. It's only a terrorist act when white supremacy is poked in the eye. That's a terrorist act. I forgot. Therefore, no ter how, how do they even imagine what they're saying to be credible? You know, we've defeated the terrorists, and then boom, there's an explosion. Right after that humiliation, the United States knocks on the door of the Australians. And here's another credible country, guys. <laughs> you know, knocks, knocks on the door. Scott Morrison, we have a proposition for you. And, and guess who else is coming? It's like, a, like one of those TV joke things with puppets, you know? You know, that's like, hey, I'm Boris Johnson, you know? <laughs> Boris Johnson, Scott Morrison, Joe Biden. Wow, what a threesome. And then they come up with this name, AUKUS. What the hell is that? AUKUS. That's terrifying to the people of the world. We're going to create an alliance called AUKUS. <laughs> and we're going to have nuclear submarines. But it's not nuclear non-proliferation. 
because we're not violating the NPT, which you know is the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty. Australia is not technically a nuclear power. You know that, right? Even though it's like a white country, basically. And you know, you sort of sometimes can be forgiven because you might imagine, well, it's Australia, they must have nuclear weapons. They're not a nuclear power. And hats off to Prime Minister Arden of New Zealand. And she didn't join AUKUS because I don't know what the acronym would be like if there was a <laughs> NZ in AUKUS. Nzik AUKUS. <laughs> so, it's not a violation of the non-proliferation treaty, although we don't care if we violate international law and so on, but it's not because the nuclear submarines are only nuclear powered. They're not going to carry nuclear weapons. Did you see that? That was amazing. I was like, wow, guys, you're, you got the best. Like, there's 100 lawyers or 500 that went over the thing. This is how you have to say it, Joe. It's not a nuclear submarine. It's a nuclear-powered submarine. We're going to create this alliance, AUKUS, and we're going to threaten the Chinese. Although, of course, they already had an alliance called the Quad, which is India, Japan, Australia, United States. They're going to meet this week in person, the leaders of these countries. Mr. Suga of Japan, Modi of India, that great democratic leader, Narendra Modi <laughs> of India, you know, the great large democracy in India, which has decided that Muslims, second class citizens, also decided Kashmir don't need any rights, also decided journalists don't know what they are. We don't have them in Indian culture. Um, <laughs> Indian culture doesn't need journalism. It's, it's, it's a cultural relativist thing and so on. <laughs> journalists. They are criminal. It's a synonym for criminals. They can be in jail. That's a better place for them, and so on. Right? They already have a platform called the Quad, but the problem with the Quad is it's not all the great settler colonial powers, because this is the authentic alliance. This is the United States, the United Kingdom. Look at their names. Why do you need an article before the name of your country? It's not the India. And the Japan, it should be the Australia, and the United States, and the United Kingdom. AUKUS. We've just been humiliated by the Afghans, but we're going to go to war against China. 1.4 billion. The first point I want to make for you, and you must be wondering, what's the point? <laughs> Is no left force in the world, no self-respecting left force should allow itself to be weaponized into this war against China. I don't care, I literally don't care what your assessment is of the Communist Party, of Xi Jinping. I don't even care if you're a racist against the Chinese people. I honestly don't care. But if you're a self-respecting human being, you should not want the world to enter a war where the United States, which is a nutty country, is willing to go to war against 1.4 billion people when it was just defeated by a country of 38 million. This is just about mathematics, guys. And let me tell you something. The Chinese have a much bigger army and navy and air force and nuclear weapons than the Afghans. Particularly, they have much more armaments than the Taliban. Now, this is a really bad idea, guys. You need to go out there and campaign like hell against this war. And I really don't think that this is an issue. I really don't think this is an issue of what you feel about the Chinese revolution. I really don't think that's the point right now. I mean, I'm going to talk, say a few things about what I think is happening in China, but that's not important. I could actually stop right now. Because all I want from you, all I'm asking of you, is to campaign. I want you to campaign against this war. I want you to join whatever platform exists in the world. I belong, the Chow Collective is a part of the No Cold War platform, nocoldwar.org. I want you to at least go to our website, sign that statement, take that statement to your neighbors, to your colleagues, to your friends. If you don't want to take the statement, talk to people. We don't need this war. The world doesn't need this confrontation. You know, the United Nations has said we need more collaboration in this period. We've got a pandemic. We have a climate catastrophe. 2.7 billion people don't know where their next meal is coming from. 
and you tell me the most pressing issue for the United States, the United Kingdom, and Australia is to create bloody AUKUS. You know, we've got a meeting coming up in Glasgow, the COP meeting for climate change. Where's the global alliance against the destruction of the planet? Where's that? 2.7 billion people are starving. Which countries have come together to say we need to create a global alliance? Fuscus, Muscus, whatever the hell it's called, <laughs> against hunger. Where's that? How do we take these people seriously? How, how do we take Joe Biden seriously? How do we take Scott Morrison, of all people, mediocre person, <laughs> how do we take Scott Morrison seriously? Boris Johnson is a clown. <laughs> if anybody thinks I'm a stupid, foolish person, and if they think Boris Johnson is a, I'll take stupid on myself, okay? <laughs> I'll take a hit for you. But I will not accept the fact that I'm more a clown than Boris Johnson. <laughs> I mean, how do these people have the right to take us into a catastrophic confrontation with a country like China, which has just helped eradicate absolute poverty in that country? What gives us the right to do that? So for the rest of my talk here with you, I want to say a few things about China, not a huge amount. I've been recently going back and reading the work of Chinese intellectuals that I greatly admire. I greatly admire Wang Hui, for instance, who is a scholar of Chinese literature and thought, teaches at Tsinghua University. I greatly admire Li Bo, who teaches Chinese studies at Fudan. I greatly admire Zhang Weiwei who's the founder of the Institute of Chinese Studies at Fudan. Well, Zhang Weiwei spent a lot of time in Geneva, understands the West, and so I greatly admire these people. Why? Because they're trying to understand the direction of their society. Years ago, in 2011, 10 years ago, Chen Enfu, who was then a sen senior scholar at the Chinese Academy of Advanced Studies in Beijing, Chen and Fu came to India. He gave a lecture in Trivandrum about the seven schools of thought in China. It was so interesting, you know. I, I had no idea that there were seven schools of thought in China. Because, you know, you, I, there's a kind of incipient ignorance that people have about places like China. You, you just think of China, you know. We talk of China like it's like the bog, you know. It's like the Chinese, the China, the China does this and China. It's 1.4 billion people, guys. Do you know how many people that is? <laughs> Do you know what the population of the United States? It's like four times or five times the population of the United States. That's a lot of people. You know, I mean, in the United States, there's a lot of different opinions. There's like post-structuralists and Foucauldians and, you know, <laughs> and Stalinists and, you know, Oh, sorry, I, I meant, we're talking about the United States. There's liberals and liberals <laughs> and neoliberals and, and conservative liberals and fascistic liberals and Trumpian liberals and, you know, I forgot. Yeah. There are many contending schools of thought in the United States, but we somehow assume that in China there's like, there's like Chinese, <laughs> you know? There's like one, there's like the Mao period and then there's the Deng period and everybody's like, Deng, Mao. <laughs> You know, and like Xi Jinping, you know, it's incredible, right? It's like a racist belief that 1.4 billion people just sort of orient themselves like we are now in the world of this thought. Everybody march to, right? Isn't that the way, isn't that the way people talk about China? Like, am I wrong about this? I'm, I mean, I'm, this is not what I'm saying. I'm just channeling what I think people say, you know, that I, I don't believe that. I don't want to be misunderstood because I know social media is a really cruel thing. People will say, do you know what he said? He said all Chinese think the same. <laughs> Somebody's going to take that clip that I just said that and they'll make that a thing, you know. Social media is a really scary thing, right? Right? I am scared of social media uh, because of this, this reason, right? Anyway, so Chen Enfu comes to Trivandrum, which is the capital of Kerala. Uh, a state 
governed by the left democratic front, of which there are communist parties, and it's an amazing place in the world, 38 million people. You know, they're not all communists. Please don't misunderstand that. Um, there's a lot of people with terrible ideas. There's a big debate happening now. Because again, everybody from Kerala isn't, we are communist. You know, it's not like that. There's people of different views and so on. Um, so we should never, you know, idealize a place and think, oh, are you from Kerala? You must be a communist. No, it could be a right wing nut. You know, it's as much a possibility, right? You meet somebody from China, they might be. Somebody, who, I'm, I'm a Chinese banker, I believe in Adam Smith and, you know, Milton Friedman, and that's, you're as likely to meet a Milton Friedman supporter in China as you are a person who says, I think Mao is a great person and so on. So Chen and Fu said there are seven contending schools of thought. I thought that's fascinating. He said there are liberals, people who think, this is funny, people who think Thomas Jefferson is the way forward, you know. <laughs> I was like, I'm not sure even in the, oh, well, actually in the United States, there are a lot of people who think a slave owner like Thomas Jefferson is the way forward, you know? So there are people there, and then he said there are, there are revivalists or Maoists, there are um, traditional Marxists, and then of course, you know, the way we all do as intellectuals, and then there are, there are, there are innovative Marxists, like him, um, <laughs> you know? And, and I like to think of myself as an innovative Marxist. Uh, because who wants to say, like, I'm an orthodox Marxist? <laughs> I'm an innovative Marxist, and so on. Seven schools of thought. That's interesting. But it's not only that there are many schools of thought in China. That's only one of the issues. The other thing is there have been fierce debates inside China amongst intellectuals, amongst party members. When you have a communist party with hundreds of millions of members, they have tens of millions of opinions in different parts of the country. And there was a terrible decade in the 90s when debate and argument was hard to come by. Because it's not that there was no opinions allowed, because the right of the argument held the high ground. And it's at that point that Wang Hui, this great intellectual, thought seriously about the idea of confidence that a country has in its traditions. Why was Chinese intellectualism, or the intellectual class, but also elements of the party, why were they losing faith in their own traditions and looking to Washington DC, New York City, and so on, Harvard University for inspiration? Why were they looking to Thomas Jefferson to lead them forward um, after the 1990s? Why were they doing that? And so he went back and he reconstructed this four volume text on the history of Chinese thought, but I'm not getting into that. What I want to talk about is that even in this time, the left was trying to engage and find a way to break out of a relative rightward drift in Chinese society. In fact, this rightward drift had been detected by Deng Xiaoping in 1983, when he said, there's a serious problem in our country. The poison of bourgeois thought has come back. This is in 83. Deng Xiaoping had a campaign against the poisons of bourgeois thought. You know, Engels, years ago, old Freddie, smartest Marxist, <laughs> smartest Marxist there ever was. I love, you know what's great about Freddie Engels? When he died, he said, cremate me, I like that, that's great, and take my ashes to the beach and throw them into the ocean. There's no grave for Freddie anywhere. You know, he was thrown, and there's a little plaque that says, we came and threw his ashes here. <laughs> Fred Engels said, before he died, he said, our socialist history is a history of zigzags. Because we're dealing with real people. There are real people involved in socialist construction. And we carry with us the flotsam of confidence, lack of confidence, fear of the unknown. Because socialism is the unknown. We know wretchedness of hierarchy. We know inequality. We know all these things. We know what it's like to be oppressed. We don't know what it's like to be free. And we're scared of freedom. Let's be honest, okay? We're scared of freedom. We're scared of making a revolution. We don't want to make a catastrophic mistake. We allow the drift back to the past to take place so fast. That undertow that pulls you back to the past is really strong. 
It's not like Deng Xiaoping was like, let's move back to the United States, restore capitalism. How many books I read with that title, The Restoration of Capitalism? They were struggling with something, how to build socialism in a wretchedly poor country. That was the assignment. It wasn't easy. Punctually in Chinese history, you've had the Communist Party figure out they made enormous mistakes. What do we think about the Great Leap Forward? May not have been such a great idea. What do we think about the Cultural Revolution? Eh, not sure. What do we think about the 78 reforms? Well, we may have gone too far. Experimentation is an interesting facet of Chinese communism. And I'm just going to give you one example of that and then come to Wang Hui's recent article in Xi Jinping, OK? OK. <laughs> I mean, unless you want me to end here and we have questions, because I know, I know there's good questions and so on. You know, when Bo Xi Lai was in charge of Chongqing, um, it's not about Bo Xi Lai, by the way. A lot, of made, lot, of, lot is made about this person. It's about what happened in Chongqing. In Chongqing, they decided, let's experiment with you know, bringing back socialist culture. Let's experiment with creating democratic neighborhood organizations. Let's try to create confidence in the masses in the direction of socialism. That was watched very carefully by the left of the party and by left intellectuals. They looked at what was happening in Chongqing carefully. That's not that Bo Xi Lai didn't have his own problems. He may have himself been corrupt and so on. That's not the point, OK? You don't need to personalize these issues. We're talking about the process, the process of the Chongqing experiment. It was a very interesting experiment in trying to develop direct democracy trying to bring people into the dynamic of history and not that they feel I'm just a consumer. You know that feeling, like in America? <laughs> where I don't know what it means to be a citizen. I'm just a consumer. Consumer activism, you ever heard that phrase? Such a strange phrase. I'm a consumer activist. What the hell is that? <laughs> I'm not a citizen, I'm a consumer. You know, I want my, I, when I pay taxes, I want something back for that. Have you heard that phrase? That's treating citizenship like a consumption agreement, you know? I pay taxes and then I want something back for those taxes. And I don't want lazy people to get my taxes for them. Have you heard that argument in the United States? You know, that kind of thing? That reduces the whole concept of citizenship to consumption. I find that very disturbing as a direction of US history. The move of democracy and citizenship into consumption-oriented thinking. You know, I pay taxes, I want, I want this back, I, I need this, and I don't want somebody else to get my taxes. It's a very disturbing understanding of society and so on. It's hard to create citizens in the world because people have to actually learn how to do this thing. It's not intuitive, you know, to be involved. You know how in our neighborhoods and places, it's idealistic people, lefties and so on, who form committees and try to push the government, or it's people on the right, but they're minorities, you know? Most people have a passive relationship to democracy. In Chongqing, the idea was how to revive democratic action, public action. It was an interesting experiment. Xi Jinping watched this very, very carefully. From 2013 onwards, in China, there was an attempt to develop more public action. And actually, what I want to say, I'm coming close to wrapping up, what I want to say is the reason in Wuhan they were able to tackle the COVID virus so rapidly wasn't just because of state action. That's actually a misunderstanding of what they did in China. It's not just state action, it's public action. There were a lot of citizens groups, neighborhood groups and so on that acted to try and track and trace, close the virus down, help people give relief and so on. That's the same reason why in Kerala, the virus rates were so much lower than the rest of India. Because again, public action, women's organization, student organization, youth organization, peasant organization, farmer organization, workers, they were out there, neighborhood to neighborhood, house to house. A 21-year-old, Arya Rajendran, was elected mayor of the largest city in Kerala, Trivandrum. She's 21 years old. The reason she won was she was part of a youth team that went door to door conducting surveys, 
what is it that you need during the lockdown how can we help you etc that's how these young people made public action something noble in their society noble you have to ennoble democracy it's not it doesn't happen by existing it has to be made democracy has to be produced it's a lot of hard work and that's what we see coming out of the current development in china that's how poverty absolute poverty was eradicated through the public action process recently wang hui wrote an article last year the same intellectual who wrote during the most difficult time in china when right right wing thinking was dominant he wrote, recently wrote an article last year about revolutionary personality the creation of revolutionary personality i like that phrase you know because in a fact what we're trying to do is we're trying to make everybody into a revolutionary the point isn't to have like a great leader or a great party or anything you know xi jinping doesn't walk around saying it is i xi jinping <laughs> who saved china from the scourge of covid-19 <laughs> i mean the guy doesn't talk like that you know it's public action that enables a society to come together to tackle a pandemic let's compare what the chinese did with what india had to succumb to what the united states succumbed to what the united kingdom succumbed to you want to go to war against china but you yourself couldn't handle the pandemic you want to go to war against china in the name of a democracy you don't have what you have is a consumerocracy you don't have a democracy your people don't feel alive to a project just when the chinese feel like they've come alive to a project you call that life authoritarianism you call that life authoritarianism who puts its journalists in jail why is julian assange in belmarsh why are so many indian activists and journalists in jail why is the enforcement directorate in india knocking at the door of journalist houses how easy it is for these countries to sit on some abstract definition of democracy and criticize 1.4 billion people who are in the middle of a giant experiment again I don't expect you to believe anything I said in the second part of my remarks here. I don't even care if you agree with me, but I want you to leave the People's Forum. Three years old now. Do you know that People's Forum just had an anniversary? Three years old. I want you. I want you to leave the People's Forum, the greatest institution in New York City. I want you to leave the People's Forum. committed not to being against the cold war against china i i don't care what you think i want you to campaign against it i want you to join cut the pentagon i want you to get involved it's not enough to believe things guys we have to build democracy the bourgeoisie is not going to donate democracy to you you have to take democracy the soros foundation isn't going to give you a grant for democracy you have to seize democracy you have to seize democracy by acting together it's called public action and if anybody needs it the united states does so see you on the streets thanks a lot Okay. Um we have about 10 minutes of interaction if that's okay and I I have a feeling uh somebody has a mic um yeah and we're going to have Are you ready already with your question? You prepared? Your hand is halfway there between a fist in the air and a hand in the air. Okay, let's start over there. My favorite questioner right here
We'll start with okay, the... Okay, I'll be brief. Thank you so much. Um, it's actually a really nice uh, way that, uh, since you ended on questions of praxis, that's exactly where um, my questions kind of want, began to lead in. I've been thinking just a lot, you talked a lot about Chinese public action, and I'm thinking a lot about kind of how public action operates, not just for the consolidation, legitimation of like party building, but also in the process of like building the party itself. So like, you've talked a few times in some different talks about like mutual aid projects in the West and how that popped up in response to COVID. And especially with like Tang's talks earlier talk, I've been thinking constantly about like how poverty alleviation in China, what we should be doing in the West is essentially like, we should be building these kinds of similar mass public systems, you know, uh, engendered like, acted out by the people, you know, with the agency of the people, like at the helm of it, and by meeting material needs, then we can actually begin to establish a system that can, you know, further than expand those kinds of programs. So my basic question is just along the lines of like anti, you know, anti Cold War campaigning, how that fits into like the developing mutual aid frameworks that, you know, continue to like, they've been, we've been working on them for years now in the US, and they keep growing, and they keep growing. And I think that's the revolutionary direction that we're gonna be building in because that's what's gaining legitimacy, because it's meeting the needs of the people like the way that the Chinese project does for the Chinese people. And in that capacity, um, I was wondering about just your general thoughts, suggestions about how we can begin to, you know, further, you know, through the mutual aid work, how we can develop into different political structures and how we can, you know, not, not just do mutual aid, not just, you know, get food to people, but make it clear that by getting food to people and the systems that get food to people and the systems that don't, that don't leave people hungry are those systems that necessitate anti-imperialism and necessitate internationalism with the Chinese people and like an understanding of the Chinese project. Firstly, I would say, does everybody watch Breakthrough News? Yeah, okay. You should watch Breakthrough News. Breakthrough News had a story about, I think it was Philadelphia, yeah. where there was a project of feeding the hungry. And I found that a very interesting project, guys, because, um, you see, I don't have the answer to your question. Because the answer to your question will become clear when you're doing what they're doing. Do you understand? Because as you build contacts and you build the fiber of society, you'll know how to talk to people. There's no formula as people are coming to you and, and the fiber of society is being built because it's frazzled, right? Then people can say, oh yeah, okay, interesting what you're talking about, the China thing, I never thought about it. Why would anybody listen to you if the fabric of your relations to other people is broken? So the problem with the American left, if I might say it a little abstractly, is that it's hard to organize in a society where the fabric of society is not so clear. It's very hard to organize. So you got to participate in building the fabric. You can't wait for the fabric to be built by the liberals and then you accelerate to socialism. Doesn't work like that. I mean, they're never going to build the fabric of society. Guys, ask Bill Clinton. <laughs> the great standard bearer of US liberalism. By the way, good question. Yeah, anybody else? Somebody in the... Right oh, okay, right there. Second row, yeah. So thank you for talking. I really appreciated what you were saying about how we are afraid of being free. Um, I am just wondering how, like what suggestions do you have to keep up our revolutionary optimism when I've been doing this work since the Iraq war and yes, we have made a lot of uh, progress but we do get horribly burnt out and we're up against this awful war machine and we're living in the belly of the beast, how do we keep up that revolutionary optimism? Because there are days where people just, we, we're burned out. We don't want, we can't do this anymore. We need to take a break, but there are people being, they're starving and the war machine keeps on running. How do we keep that optimism? Well, on the break question, I can't help you. Um, I have a problem with that, personally. I, I, I'll acknowledge it publicly. It's a problem, okay? But I'm going to say something that you already know, because you've done this for a while. One of the reasons we join parties or projects or groups and so on is that we know, we, we get rid of this idea that we are indispensable. You know that feeling? And I hate it. You know, I, I, I know this feeling when if I miss a demonstration, I feel terrible, like I wasn't there, you know. But it's not like your presence is so essential. You know, I stayed home and I watched Ozarks on TV or whatever the hell, you know. I mean, you're allowed to relax and, you know, do whatever you like to do when you relax, right? I mean, part of the reason joining a political organization is essential isn't just to strengthen our politics, you know. 
many fingers, it's not as strong as a close, blah, blah, blah. It's not only that. It's also to let you feel like you're part of a project, not that you're individually trying to save the world. There's a little bit in a broken society, the left develops a kind of messiah complex, you know, individually. Like, I got to do this, I got to do that. You got to just, well, I'm telling you, it's bizarre for me to say this, but sometimes it's okay to say, look, I can't be involved in this, I'm going to take a break, and so on. There's nothing wrong with that. I mean, I know that what happens in our culture, and by, by that I mean our international left culture, because there is something similar in our international left culture. A lot of pressure is put on each other. You know, you got to do this, you got to do that, you got to show up for this. You know that phrase, show up. You got to show up, you got to show up. I know that. But look, I, I, I'm 54 years old. I didn't even know which Iraq war you were talking about because, you know, there's like two of them, eight of them. I, I don't even know after a point, right, Rafiq? I mean, which Iraq war? Like the Iran-Iraq war, Iraq number one war, Iraq number two war. And you know how it is we call these Iraq war. It's not a bloody Iraq war. It's a U.S. war. It's a U.S. war. It's a U.S. war, right? Anyway, um, but still... You've got to be a long-distance runner, you know. I, I need you there for a long time. And, you know, we've got lots of people who've been there longer than I and so on. We, we take inspiration and hope in the fact that we believe in the values that we were taught. You know, all the values of the left aren't alien to broad human civilization. Like, not, nothing, nothing in Marxism is alien to humanity. You know, we believe in equality. We believe in fairness. We believe that people should be, you know, not hungry. I mean, we believe people should have shoes. You know, I recently discovered that a billion people in the planet don't have shoes. One billion people, that, that disturbed me. It disturbed me more than that almost three billion can't eat, you know? I don't know why, but that really disturbed me a lot, that a billion people don't have shoes. And the reason that disturbed me is that last year, Global Footwear, the industry, made 23 billion shoes. We made 23 billion shoes in 2020, and yet a billion people don't have shoes. How many pairs of shoes do we have? And I know, today I'm wearing my nice sneakers, so I'm hiding them. <laughs> I'm hiding them as I say that, okay? Because, look, there's an old joke, okay? They always say, oh, communists want to abolish first class, right? And I say, no, we want to abolish second class, right? Yeah. Right. <laughs> okay. Somebody else. There's a few hands, but several over there, one over there. Let's go, let's go back and then we'll come back. Yeah. Yeah, we want to abolish second class. You get that, right? Yeah, everybody deserves a break. Yeah. Um, I definitely, you know, I agree with so many of, in the history of communism and Marxist thinking and that tradition have emphasized the, the real protracted nature of people's struggle, of people's war, of, of these processes that will eventually lead to liberation. But I also want to pose a quote from a uh, field marshal of the Black Panther Party, George Jackson, who said, how do you make long-term struggle relevant to those who expect to die tomorrow? In regards to this struggle against the Cold War, and to the, in regards to this struggle against capitalism that we know will be protracted, in our mass work, how do we make long-term struggle appealing and relevant to those who expect to die tomorrow? I mean, the question is, what are you struggling for? You know, revolutionaries like us are not always struggling just for ourselves. We're struggling for the sake of our collective project. You know, in a big, giant way, we're struggling for humanity and so on and so forth, right? Um, I mean, we're not struggling only to better things for ourselves, although we, we're trying. I mean, I, I'm one of those people, my friend, that doesn't believe that we're waiting for, you know, you know how people talk, there'll never be a revolution in my life, it'll be later. Oh my God, I, I'm the opposite of that. I'm the complete opposite of that. Like, I, would, I hate it when people say, I'm in it for the struggle. I, I am not in it for the struggle. <laughs> the struggle is exhausting. You know, I don't want this to continue forever. I hate this. How many meetings do I have to go for strategy and all these absurd debates and ideas and the hate speeches of the, you know, yeah. I mean, I want socialism. That's what I want. I don't want an anti-capitalist struggle. I'm not interested in that. Right? You know, I'm 54 years old. So it's possible. 
But even if I was 64 or 74, I would still think it's possible. Because you never know, you know. Do you think the people sitting in Zimmerwald in Switzerland in, you know, 1915, 16, Lenin and Cup, do you think they were like, we're going to make comrades <laughs> next year, <laughs> next year in St. Petersburg? <laughs> you know, comrades, next year in St. Petersburg. Bukharin, get ready to write the ABCs of communism. Because we will need to mass produce that sucker and get every little Soviet kid to read that book which is so boring. You better do it. And send a message to Stalin that he has to start writing the short course on the history of the CPUSA B. No, oh, they thought this is never going to happen. <laughs> <You know? laughs> We're, we're like 16 of us sitting here and we're going to discuss the long-term strategy, comrades. If you ever read the Zimmerwald Declaration, you'll realize they had no clue. <laughs> Next year, Lenin, you're going to be in a SEAL train, thanks to the Russians, the Germans, sorry. And they're going to send you and so on and so forth. And then you'll be writing State and Revolution on your lap in a toilet somewhere in Finland. <laughs> you know, we don't know what's going to happen. So we can't have this long-term perspectivism. We got to fight to win, you know, that's the point. Because like, you know, the planet can be destroyed. You know, do you feel that sometimes? Like the planet can be destroyed, yeah. Sometimes in my head, I feel like that guy in a city, in every country in the world that carries a sign that says the end of the world is nigh. <laughs> you know, and they not even have to be a Christian. They can be like a radical environmentalist. Sometimes in my head, I feel like that guy, you know? And then I have to control myself and say, relax, you know, we're, we're going to win. It's okay. We will win before, they, before we allow them to annihilate us. We will win. We have to win. We have to fight so hard that we win. There's no point leaving the room here and saying, you know, oh, he was interesting on the Cold War. Yeah, I thought that was interesting. This is not a bloody movie. You know, go eat popcorn and then have a discussion at the bar. What do you think about what he said? about? I don't give a shit what you thought about this or that or what I said. I need you to go out there and campaign against this war. I need you to fight to build socialism. I don't need you to discuss and nitpick about little things I said about Wang Hui and Li Bo and whatever the hell. What was his opinion actually about Xi Jinping? What does it matter? You know, really what does it matter? What matters is what are you going to do, my friend? What are you going to do? What are you going to do? <laughs> right? Okay. Now, this is the third year anniversary of the People's Forum. And if, if I was a different person, and if you were all creative people, I would have asked us to sing happy birthday to the People's Forum. Um, so I'm not going to say that. But I want you, in the next 10 minutes, if you run into anybody who has a name tag which says staff on it, and because it's COVID, I suppose it would be inappropriate for me to say, go and hug them. But I want you to go up to people where it says staff, and I'd like you to thank them. Because I want to thank them for allowing me into the People's Forum family now and before. Thanks a lot. <laughs>